Volgograd, 1972. In winter, as in summer, Russian schoolchildren mount guard in front of the eternal flame, burning in the memorial to the dead of the great battle of the Volga. Thirty years previously, Volgograd was called Stalingrad. Thirty years ago, other children, German children, wished their Führer a happy birthday. Adolf Hitler was 53 years old. His triumphant armies occupied the whole of Europe. During the summer of 1941, they had invaded Russia and stood at the gates of Moscow. Until now, the German generals, who perfected the Blitzkrieg, had experienced nothing but success. They are ready to begin the conquest of Africa, Asia, and even the whole world. At the beginning of 1942, Hitler mobilizes all his forces from the far corners of Europe so that he can finish off Russia. Five million, 400,000 German soldiers. He makes his allies provide 800,000 men either willingly or by coercion. The Italian 8th Army of his friend Mussolini, the 2nd Hungarian Army of Admiral Horty, the 3rd and 4th Romanian armies of Antonescu's fascist regime. In the spring of 1942, this immense striking force, the biggest concentration of strength yet seen, consists of 3,200 tanks, 3,400 airplanes, 57,000 guns more than six million men, ten times more than Napoleon's Grand Army, are ready to march eastward. The German general staff wishes to take Moscow, which had been the objective of the first lightning attack by the Germans the previous summer. Moscow, which should have been taken in three weeks, but held out all winter. Stalin expects the new blow to fall on Moscow. Hitler is more imaginative. Now that America has entered the war, he decides that he must prepare for a long struggle. His objectives are based on economic goals, and above everything else, he needs the oil and fuel resources of the Middle East. In Africa, Rommel is on the march towards Cairo. Hitler decides to attack in Russia by a drive to the south in the direction of the Caucasus and its oil. He wants to close the German pincers around the oil reserves of the Middle East. The key to this vast strategic plan is Stalingrad. On the 28th of June, 1942, General von Bock, with 89 divisions, of which nine are armored, attacks along a front of 250 miles. From positions around Kursk and Kharkov, the German armies go forward, rolling up the desperate but inadequate Russian defenses. Within a few days, the Germans advance nearly a hundred miles and take thousands of Russian prisoners. The Soviet high command, who had feared that Moscow was the objective, now has to rapidly change its plan, and Stalin orders reinforcements to be sent south to Voronezh, the nearest town in the line of the German advance. Arriving in haste, the Russian general Golikov attempts to stem the advance with his tank. determination are not enough to stop the German advance, however, and the German Stukow dive bombers break up the Russian positions.
German armoured columns press on, covering great distances without meeting any serious opposition. Ahead lies Rostov, the only remaining bastion barring the approach to the Don River crossing, the last obstacle to Stalingrad. Will the main Russian force be waiting at Rostov? As it turned out, the city was defended only by its garrison, which fought a bitter rearguard action. Other Russian forces retreated to the east in a desperate fight to avoid being caught in a huge battle of encirclement. The Germans took a week to win the battle and a major victory. Rostov fell on the 28th of July. For the Germans, the plan of campaign seemed to be working well. For the Russians, the summer is dark indeed. A summer of huge defeats at Kharkov, at Sevastopol, at Rostov. A continuing series of military disasters. In one month, the German Wehrmacht has penetrated over 200 miles into the heart of Russia. The road ahead seems open. However, when the armies of von Bock arrive on the banks of the Don, the high command is uneasy. Where are the bulk of the Soviet forces? On the far side of the river, long columns of refugees flee towards the east. Obeying an ancient instinct, the Russian people make a wasteland of the country into which the German forces will advance. The civilian population abandons farms, villages and towns. All that is precious to the people is destroyed or burned before they follow the retreating columns of the Russian army wearily trudging eastward. Hitler, always impatient, arrives in Vinitsa in the Ukraine to personally direct the military operations. If the rank and file greet him with enthusiasm, it's not the case with the generals of the high command who resent his intervention. He dismisses von Bock and takes command himself, cancelling all the operational plans of the general staff. The original plan was to take Stalingrad with the entire German force before advancing on the Caucasus. Hitler now decides to do both simultaneously and on July the 23rd, 1942, he splits his forces sending half his army towards Stalingrad and the other half into the Caucasus. The decision is bitterly opposed by his general staff. The German army is set out in an irresistible flood towards the Caucasus, across the vast Don Plain and into the rivers of the Kuban and the Terek. As the German formations advance deep into the hot and sandy wastes of the Kalmyk steppes, the proud armoured columns soon look more like a horde of migrating Tartars. Water holes become more important than achieving military victories. While half his attacking force is wandering about the Caucasus, Hitler launches the 6th Army under General Paulus on the main objective, Stalingrad and the Volga. Stalingrad, which extends some 30 miles along the western banks of the Volga, the biggest river in Europe. Once named Tsaritsyn, the local museum recalls that in 1919 it had been defended against the white armies by a young Georgian revolutionary, Joseph Stalin. Stalingrad, whose factories were like industrial cathedrals dedicated to the revolution and whose names recalled the past, barricades, Red October. Giant factories had been built which supplied most of the agricultural tractors used in Russia and now built tanks for the armored divisions of the Red Army. This was the place that Stalin chose to stop Hitler's might. On the 30th of July, he issues an order of the day 
not one step back. He nominates two men to the Defense Committee of Stalingrad. One, a soldier, General Yaredmenko, the other, a political commissar, Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev immediately makes known the wishes of Stalin. Soviet soldiers must show an iron discipline with nerves of steel. Those are the conditions of victory and the slogan of the Russian spirit. Each man must be prepared to die like a hero. General Yaramenko is 39 years old and Stalin's favorite fighting man. He is given four days to gather the retreating Russian forces and to organize the defense of the southwestern front. Fortifications must be created at once. Here was the large Russian force which the German high command had been seeking. They had retreated in order to stand at Stalingrad. Hitler had been mistaken. The Russians were not completely defeated. The Germans draw ever closer. General Paulus and his 6th Army have crossed the Don and pressed forward towards Stalingrad. The German advance runs into the first Russian lines of defense around Kalat, and a bitter battle rages as the Russians desperately resist the armored and infantry assaults of the 6th German Army, Hitler's chosen force. After heavy and savage fighting between the Don and Volga rivers, the Germans take Kalach and cut the railway line running between Moscow and Stalingrad. In a final push, the 16th Panzer Division breaks through to the north of Stalingrad and reaches the western bank of the Volga on a five-mile front. Churchill rushes to Moscow to give Stalin his assurance of support. He's accompanied by President Roosevelt's representative, Avril Harriman. Will the Russians be able to hold? The Americans and British ask themselves. When will they open their second front? Foreign Minister Molotov asks himself. Churchill, who also had to fight alone in 1940, understands better than most the agony of the Russian situation. Unfortunately, all that he can bring with him at the moment are words. Fortunately, he understands the use of words. Whatever our suffering, whatever our toils, we will continue hand in hand like comrades and brothers until every vestige of the Nazi regime has been beaten into the ground. The Russians had hoped for more. When they see him on the newsreels giving the V for victory sign, they believe that the two fingers indicate a second front. The Americans and the British promise to send large shipments of material, planes, trucks and jeeps. But Stalin knows now that at Stalingrad, the Russian army will be all alone to carry the full weight of the German war machine. The Germans have now reached the suburbs of Stalingrad. Hitler has ordered that the city must be taken before the 25th of August. The troops will have to hurry up. At first it all seems straightforward, but soon things will begin to go wrong. The 
day of the Blitzkrieg is over. Stalingrad is practically encircled, but Stalingrad fights on. Hitler decides that Stalingrad must be destroyed. On the 23rd of August, 1942, 600 bombers of the 4th Air Fleet, commanded by General von Richthofen, are ordered to wipe out the city. Flying in relays, the Heinkels and Junkers return to reload at their airfields and manage to carry out 2,000 sorties over Stalingrad. Thousands of tons of bombs fall all over the city. They leave 30 miles of ruins and 40,000 victims. The civilians who survived the bombing are evacuated, while General Yaromenko orders the 62nd and 64th Soviet armies to transform the city into a fortress. Stalingrad, pride of the Soviet Union, lies in ruins, but each ruin will now become a barricade. In some parts of the city, the chimneys are all that are left of the wooden houses that were destroyed by fire during the bombing. At the beginning of September, General Paulus hurls the German 6th Army into the final attack on the city. German General Staff believes that Stalingrad, which has been pulverized by bombing, will fall as easily as a ripe fruit. The expected victory harvest is delayed, however. On the 12th of September, General Chuikov is appointed to command the 62nd Army. He is 42 years old and promises to save Stalingrad or die with his men. His first priority is to bring reinforcements into the city from across the river. Under German artillery fire, the Russian naval units of the Volga manage to keep a lifeline open and are sometimes able to land men and material to reinforce the depleted garrison troops. Just when the battered 62nd Army is on the point of collapse, the naval forces manage to bring in an elite guards division, commanded by General Rodinsev. It's the 14th of September. One week later, the Radinsev division is still fighting in the centre of the city and entrenched around the railway station, but its strength is down to 80 men. Only the tremendous Russian artillery barrage, firing support from the east bank of the Volga, manages to hold the Germans back. One after another, the best Russian regiments are being consumed, and it's a matter of concern as to how long the 62nd Russian army can last. The highest point in the city is the Mamayev Hill. 300 feet high, it looks out over the valley of the Volga and dominates the city. General Chuikov has set up his command post here. The Mamayev Hill is the scene of some of the heaviest fighting of a two-month battle changes hands several times. At the end of September, the Germans hold the hill and from there can overlook the entire city, the industrial zone, the centre and the railway station. 
they now know that they will have to take Stalingrad street by street. In the event, it takes two divisions and five days of fighting with cold steel to capture the railway station, which had been defended by the last survivors of a guards unit and the parachute troops of Colonel Yali. It's October before General Paulus can attack the industrial quarter with five divisions, two of them armored. In the wreckage of the tractor factory, the Russian workers turn out tanks until the very last moment. When the German advance is nearly upon them, they put on military uniforms and go out to meet the enemy in tanks, which they had only just completed. General Paulus throws all his reserves into the battle, seven divisions. The German Panzer Grenadiers advance yard by yard through the residential zones, the Red October factory, the barricade factories. Constantly, the Russian troops counterattack. The crack guard units, the Siberian soldiers of General Batyuk. In two weeks, three Russian divisions lose 75% of their strength. The German Stuka dive bombers put in a final blow. On the banks of the Volga, the last gasoline stores of the Russian army are destroyed, and a sea of fire sweeps over the shelter of General Chuikov, who continues to issue orders from his command post. At the end of October, the Germans occupy the last factories. The dead Russian soldiers and workmen had kept their promise. They had not retreated. General Paulus tells Hitler that the Sixth Army holds Stalingrad, or at least 90% of it. They raise the German flag in the center of the town. They have reached the west bank of the Volga. Hitler is exultant. He strikes a medal to commemorate the victory. Throughout Europe, he posts notices of the latest German triumph. On the 9th of November, in Munich, he makes a long speech announcing the good news. Vor allem aber, Sie kennen Sie immer am gleichen Platz. Sie und da sagen Sie dann bescheiden, nach 14 Tagen, wir haben ein, eine Stadt evakuiert. Aber im Allgemeinen kämpfen Sie seit dem 22. Juni am gleichen Platz immer erfolgreich. Immer werden wir zurückgeschlagen. Und sie bei diesem fortgesetzten Zurückschlagen ist langsam bis zum Kaukasus gekommen. The speech is received more appreciatively by the Nazi officials than the soldiers who are listening far away in Stalingrad. Nur sagen die anderen, warum kämpfen sie da nicht? Weil ich kein zweites Verdun machen will. Although Hitler speaks contemptuously of the 10% of the city still held by the Russians, they, unlike him, intend to turn the defense of Stalingrad into another Verdun. And the slogan is, for the motherland and for Stalin. The supply line to the beleaguered Russian forces is now only a trickle. The German artillery prevents groups of more than 10 or 20 men crossing the Volga under cover of darkness. Day 
after day, night after night, week after week, the hell of combat in Stalingrad continues, together with the agony of fear, thirst, hunger and hate. The savage fighting that dragged on endlessly became a test of human endurance for both the forces involved. There was no place for great tactical manoeuvres. The war was reduced to the defence of a cellar or a wall, with the enemy only a few yards away. Day and night, the hand-to-hand -hand fighting never gave the soldiers the chance to pull out for a rest. General Chuikov issued an order to his snipers that each German soldier must be made to feel that he was always in the sights of a Russian rifle. The Germans, past masters of the rapid attack and technical breakthrough, found that fighting in the ruins of a large city had lost them most of their advantage especially if the defenders were prepared to die rather than give up. The Russian reinforcements could only come across the Volga from the eastern side under cover of darkness, and it was not possible to cross in large units. The great problem facing the Russian command was that the attrition of Stalingrad would swallow up men at a greater rate than they could be replaced. Under these conditions, it was impossible to know the true loss rate as men disappeared in the inferno of battle. Thousands of Russian soldiers crossed the Volga only to disappear forever in the ruins that claimed them. All Russia was later to know the names of 23 men of a crack guards regiment who held a house for 58 days against the best units of the German army there were hardly any survivors. One of those Russian soldiers who fought at Stalingrad, Konstantin Simonov, became a famous writer. And during the terrible days when all his friends were dying around him, he wrote a poem which all Russia learned. If you wait for me, I will return. But wait for me truly, very truly. Wait for me when the yellow rain brings sadness. Wait for me when the snowflakes turn. Wait for me when summer conquers all. Wait until the past is forgotten and we no longer await the others. Wait until from other lands no further news will come. Wait until they shall rest, those who along with you had waited. The Russian winter makes an early appearance in Stalingrad on the 16th of November. The Volga begins to freeze. Soon, the supply lines will be cut. Soon, ammunition will run out. General Rodintsev and the other defenders of the city wonder what was meant by Stalin when he broadcast over the radio that soon we will dance in our streets. The reason for Stalin's cryptic statement was that he had secretly ordered General Zhukov, the saviour of Moscow and Leningrad, to attempt to save Stalingrad. After carefully analysing the situation, we put the following plans forward for Stalin's consideration. Firstly, we would continue to exhaust the Germans in Stalingrad. Secondly, we would immediately prepare for a surprise counter-offensive. For the past month, in great secrecy, Zhukov has gathered together a formidable array of armour and infantry. 900 tanks from factories in the Urals amassed on the far bank of the Volga. A million men, a new army. Stalin has re-established the ranks and orders of the old regime. The influence of the political commissars is cut. The Red Army is now the Russian army. The new divisions, completely re-equipped, are brought down to the Don and the Volga by pontoons and ferryboats. The Russian Thunderbolt will be totally unexpected.
attack will begin at 6.30 a.m. on the morning of November the 19th under the command of General Voronov. The surprise is total. Within 24 hours, Rokossovsky has routed the 3rd Romanian Army. 37,000 Romanians dejectedly shuffle across the winter plains, prisoners of the Russians. Further south, Yeramenko has swept up the Italians, all those unwilling Latins far from home and lost in the frozen wastes of Russia. On the 22nd of November, in the region of Kalach, the Russian armies of the Don and the Volga meet up and close the ring around the Germans, cut off at Stalingrad. German army, with 22 divisions, 330,000 men, is now held in a pocket which measures 40 miles by 25 miles. The soldiers of the German 6th Army begin to wonder why they have not received orders to break out of the Russian encirclement. The officers on the staff of the surrounded army urge General Paulus to act quickly before it's too late. But Paulus hesitates and delays a decision. All the while, the Russian tanks draw closer. The German 6th Army is still a formidable force. It could still break the Russian circle, but it would have to leave Stalingrad. Paulus asks Hitler to let him make a decision on the spot as to whether he should hold or withdraw from the city. At the same time, a dramatic conference is being held at the Führer's headquarters at Vinitsa. The general staff pleads with Hitler to pull out the 6th Army. Goering assures his leader that he can supply the trapped German force by air and the Luftwaffe will carry out the task. Hitler accepts this solution and sends Paulus a direct order. Hold on at all costs. Supplies will be sent by air. The Luftwaffe assembles all available planes in Russia to support the massive supply operation. army requires 600 tons of rations and ammunition daily. Goering has no doubts. I guarantee it, he promises. 
Very soon, it becomes evident that he cannot keep such a promise. The Russian anti-aircraft batteries are too numerous and accurate. Russian fighter pilots swear solemnly to close the skies around Stalingrad. The oath echoes across the frozen fields of Russia. Rodina! Rodina! Tavari Stalin! Tavari Stalin! Lenyansa is so virtuous! Lenyansa is so virtuous! Nisti! Nisti! Boyevu you have to! The mastery of the skies no longer belongs to the Luftwaffe, but to the Yaks, to the MiGs, and to the Stomoviks of the Russian Air Force. In spite of the losses, in spite of the cold, which freezes the hands of the mechanics and ices up the engines, the Luftwaffe tries to the very limit to get through to the 6th Army and evacuate the wounded. But it will never be able to keep the promises made by Goering. Cut off from vital supplies, the German troops are reduced to two ounces of bread and less than an ounce of fat a day. The wounded can no longer be evacuated. Hitler decides he must try and save the Sixth Army by a ground offensive. Field Marshal von Manstein, coming up from the Caucasus, receives an order to go to the rescue of Paulus, now isolated behind the new front line. To achieve this, Manstein will have to break through the Russian positions. The plan is to drive through the encircling Russian forces and enable Paulus to begin a breakout from his side. On the 12th of December, attacking with several hundred tanks, Manstein opens a corridor through the Russian front. On the 19th of December, the leading troops of Manstein's army are only 24 miles from the trapped 6th Army. Manstein will never get any further towards the city. Why didn't Paulus attempt to break out and join the relieving German forces? He is indecisive. The 6th Army is short of fuel. It has 8,000 wounded, men who cannot be moved. The troops are exhausted. Paulus's hesitation has cost him his last chance of retreat. On December the 19th, one of the rare supply flights gets through to drop some sacks to the trapped German army. Instead of Christmas packages or medicine, the capsule contains an order from Hitler to hold Stalingrad at all costs. On the 1st of January, 1943, it's minus 25 degrees. On the 5th of January, minus 30 degrees. Why don't the Russians attack? The massed armies of Rokossovsky have been ordered to clear the German pocket still holding out at Stalingrad. They're ready to attack, but Rokossovsky and his staff think there may be another solution if the Germans will accept the hopelessness of their position. On the 8th of January, Rokossovsky, following a traditional ritual, sends an ultimatum calling for surrender. To the officers, other ranks, and soldiers of the German army who surrender, we guarantee their lives and safety, 
and after the war, a return to Germany or any country of their choice. Otherwise, the German forces now surrounded will be wiped out. Once more, Hitler sends a radio message. It is forbidden to surrender. The ultimatum is rejected. On the 10th of January at 8 o'clock in the morning, 7,000 Russian guns open the attack. Germans, overwhelmed, withdraw towards the Volga, and the dislocated troops scurry back to take shelter in the ruins of Stalingrad, where they will make a final stand. Although worn down and exhausted, the German 6th Army resists the pressure of seven Russian armies who launch the final assault on the 17th of January. The Russian soldiers are forced to take the ruins of their city house by house, cellar by cellar, in close combat. The fierce German defence prolongs the agony of fighting for two long weeks. The Mamaya Hill must be retaken. The Central Railway Station must be taken. Great factories of barricades and Red October must be retaken. The tractor factory also. The centre of the town must be liberated. Finally, the red flag once more shows its colours over the recaptured city. In clearing the cellars of the Univermag department store, soldiers of the 64th Army uncover by accident the hideout of General Paulus and his staff. They are flushed out and brought before the Russian commander. The night before, Hitler had raised Paulus to the rank of field marshal. Had it been to reward him for being sacrificed, or was it in the hope that he would die in action? Hitler had not foreseen that he had made him the first field marshal to be taken prisoner. Captain along with Paulus are all the members of his staff and 2,500 officers, among them 24 generals, aristocratic Prussians still showing their arrogance. Grizzled professional soldiers hardened by service. Young fanatics still convinced of Nazi superiority. For the first time, the proud German war machine tastes the full cup of bitter defeat and humiliation. On the 2nd of February, the last German soldiers holding out in the wrecked factories surrender their weapons. Now, the Russians know 
that victory is possible. The German Reich has suffered a mortal wound. lost 200,000 men killed in action or dead from wounds, hunger and cold. Only 91,000 prisoners are left to march away. In liberated Stalingrad, Rogosovsky, Yeremenko, Chuikov, Khrushchev, and all the victorious Russian commanders, all the Russian soldiers understand at last the words of Stalin, who once said, soon we shall dance in our own streets. Thirty years later, on the Mamayev Hill, a huge monument has been erected in keeping with the immense sacrifice made by the defenders of Stalingrad so long ago. The walls carry huge tablets listing the names of those who died. No one has ever been able to count them. The Russian government has never revealed the number. This gigantic monument stands for them all. Fifteen major battles of the Second World War. Their impact was enormous and decisive. See newly released documentary footage on the dramatic encounters in the Atlantic and the Pacific. See the great historical battles in Russia, the Normandy landing, the bombing of Berlin, the invasion of Italy. See the big battles of World War II, the fateful encounters upon which hung the destinies of men and nations. See the big battles.